You're listening to Nightlight Radio Network. This is Dr. Bob Hieronymus, co-host of 21st Century Radio. We are happy to present this rebroadcast of our show on Nightlight. Tonight's show is dedicated to Merlene Swan Ryder, who passed away peacefully in her sleep earlier this week. Merlene was a loving mother, sister, daughter, and grandmother as the younger sister of the famous psychic Ingo Swan. She was often at her big brother's side from their days as kids in Telluride, Colorado, to hosting the Stargate remote viewers in her home, to being at his bedside when he died. She and her daughter, Ellie Flippin, ensured that Ingo's research, artwork, and legacy were properly preserved. As we will hear in tonight's interview, which was recorded in March 2019. Thank you, Merlene. You will be missed. Now, on with the show. Well, welcome back to 21st Century Radio. I'm Dr. Bob Hieronymus, your host and our executive producer and research assistant is Laura Cordner. Our engineer tonight is Anita Brockington. Tonight, we are really excited to present to you the first interview on a brand new book discovered in the archives of Ingo Swan several years ago after he passed away. Late last year, we heard from Ingo's niece and representative for his estate, the intriguing Ellie Flippin, whom we've had the pleasure to meet several times. Ellie told us that her uncle, the famous psychic Ingo Swan, had written a book in 1989, but never published it. We're going to delve into the mystery behind the 29-year delay in publishing this book with three guests tonight. Regular listeners to 21st Century Radio will be familiar with the name Ingo Swan as a frequent guest here and as a subject of many of our interviews with other researchers in the power of the human potential. Ingo Swan is considered the father of remote viewing because he is the one who designed the protocols and trained the military on how to do what he and other natural psychics did naturally. Learn to be psychic by following an exact scientific approach. Ingo passed away in 2013, but tonight we will be joined by three guests to tell us about this newly discovered book he wrote in 1989 called Psychic Literacy and the Coming Psychic Renaissance. Our main guest will be retired Lieutenant Colonel Thomas McNear a student of Ingo Swan and a member of the Army Psychic Spying Program known today as Stargate. Ingo described Tom McNear as his best student ever. In addition to being the first member trained in remote viewing by Ingo Swan, Tom was actually the only member that Ingo trained in all the stages of remote viewing. Tom would join us a little later this hour. Because first, we will be, in, be, will be joined by Ingo's niece, Ellie Flippin, and then by the archivist and librarian for Ingo's estate, Blynn Oliveri. Ingo Swan's niece, Ellie Flippin, lived with Ingo three times during her life and served as his assistant, special assist, assistance planner and research assistant, telephone screener, fax machine fixer, transcriber, and Sue Chef. Today, she is responsible for Ingo's social media sites, managing his publications, and with her mother, who is working on a documentary film about Ingo's life. Welcome to 21st Century Radio, Ellie. Oh, thank you. It's so great to hear your voice. Well, thank you. It's great to hear your voice again, dear, too. So, we'll be joined in a few minutes by Blynn Oliveri, who will describe the moment they discovered the unpublished manuscript. So, let's start with some background. Why was the University of West Georgia selected to receive the Ingo Swan archives? Well, it's certainly a great question. And uh, if if I'll probably interject with some of Ingo's own words, too. So, um, if there's one word that sums up Ingo, it's probably director. <laughs> it's probably something you came across yourself in speaking with him, yes. I'm sure, many times. It's a role he continued, I think, from the beginning of his life to the end of his life, and I think continues to play even now, today, six years after his death. So in this capacity of director, 
My uncle left a document that included his wishes for what he wanted to happen after he passed away. And I say needed because shortly after he passed away, my mom and I were actually discussing some things that didn't that kind of deviated from his directives. And as we were sitting at a table talking about our grand plans, a glass actually flipped over onto its side and it rolled slowly, kind of ominously toward us. And this was against the slant of the table. And as it rolled, my mom and I, we stared at it. And I'll tell you, we held our breaths. And when it stopped, we looked at each other and said, nope, we're not going to do whatever it was we were going to do. And that was probably the very first and the very last time we thought about deviating against his wishes. So, right. So I have to say a lot of what he wanted done was really, really challenging. It's not like he made it easy. And I'm sure a lot of people can attest to that. He, He didn't make things very easy. But that was Uncle Ingo. He was very demanding. But what a lot of people don't know is that he was also very compassionate. Anyway, in this document, he laid out a number of things, such as where to hold his memorial service, which was under a very specific painting in a little museum. And I see that on your webpage, actually, Tom McNear is standing under that painting and he's speaking at the memorial service. It's The Mother of the World by Nicholas Rorich. So among these directives was, and I'll quote him, the files and books belonging to the Cosmic Art Archives should be donated to the American Art Archives or some other art-related group who could perceive the historical value. All of my personal papers, research files, and anything pertaining to my psychic life, including my psychic book library, should be donated to any library wishing to have them. So the Cosmic Files actually took up two file cabinets in his uh, basement area and contained all the correspondences and materials such as original sketches and photos of works um, related to the book. And I think it's over 100 different artists that uh, Raymond and Lilla Piper corresponded with to put together this kind of commendum on cosmic art. But when Raymond passed away, Lilla turned to my uncle and he worked to get the book published and it's something that he edited and he wrote the foreword to. So I knew from my years with Ingo that his biggest concern were these cosmic art files. And so whatever was going to be his biggest concern was going to be my biggest concern. And you can see he actually put it first in his directives of his things. So I reached out to the National Art Archives, but they were not interested. And that kind of left a blank for us to, you know, what kind of archive to turn to. So we thought about academic archives. And I knew that Duke was no longer affiliated with the Rhine Center. And when I surveyed the landscape for an archive and an academic institution that kind of dealt with cosmic or super normal themes, what was in front of me was pretty barren, I thought. Um, I knew from Ingo's works that the University of Virginia had a division called perpetual studies, you know, something that was focused on past lives and the survival of consciousness after death. So I wrote to them and they responded to me. You know, the cosmic art files were not a fit for them, but they did open up the idea that some other places would be interested in them and, and in fact in Ingo as well. And I'll quote what they wrote to me. He said, after doing a bit of research on Swan's work, I wonder if you might be interested in contacting special collections at the University of West Georgia, which has a specialty in psychic research. Finally, you may want to contact the American Visionary Art Museum. They focus on, quote, fantastic art of all kinds and are really a marvelous institution. I hope these suggestions are helpful as you seek the right home for these fascinating materials. So, you know, on a side note, we did reach out to the American Visionary Art Museum and they were more than thrilled to receive Ingo's masterpiece paintings where you'll find them today in their stale world. But, you know, that's a different story and, you know, kind of off topic. But so back to the archives, I I did reach out to the University of West Georgia and their response was not only would they love the cosmic art files, they also said, quote, your uncle's materials would enhance our collections in the field of paranormal psychology a great deal. So we thought this was at once like incredibly marvelous and also very bold. I mean, this was a state school, which seemed to me to be in the middle of farmland and kind of the southwestern part of Georgia. I mean, we were blown away. It's pretty incredible. 
Um, I learned that they had a humanistic psychology department and had just hired a professor for parapsychology. Not only, yeah, not only that, Special Collections was in the process of completing Dr. William Roll's archives, and I knew that he and Ingo went back, went way back, and that they had worked together. Yeah. Indeed. Yeah, what I did not know at the time, but do now, of course, is that the parapsychology program at the University of West Georgia actually goes back quite a bit, and that Dr. Roll was instrumental in its development. So I knew that Ingo had immense respect for Dr. Roll and his work, and so we could think of no better place or a more perfect of a match. And so that's what my mom did. She donated everything related to Ingo's archives, including the cosmic art files, to University of West Georgia. And you dedicated the book to the special collections within the Ingram Library at the University of West Georgia on the beautiful campus in Carrollton, Georgia. I was I'm surprised that uh, I hadn't known some of this before. I have we, uh, we used to call Dr. Roll Bill. Bill. Um, yeah, he used to join us on 21st Century Radio, and um, he was just extraordinary. And it's just amazing that he he working in the same field and connected with you. Congratulations. Yes, and we, we feel so fortunate um, to have found the university and to have been embraced by the university. I mean, it's just phenomenal what they're doing, and we applaud them. And, and I think that was why we really wanted to dedicate the book to them. But we needed to find some, some sort of connection or a way to dedicate it to them. And we thought about it. Ingo actually studied French, Spanish, German, and Latin. I found this actually in his transcript, his high school transcripts and his college transcripts. And so I knew he was, I knew he was always a great lover of the meaning of words to their roots. And you can see that in his writings, always kind of dissecting the words. Um, but particularly he seemed to go to Latin. He liked Latin. It was his favorite. So I thought, okay, we want to find something in Latin as an, as a nod to Ingo, but we wanted to reflect university of West Georgia's willingness to go where where it just seems like no one else is willing to go academically. And we also wanted to reflect some aspect of the book itself. So I, I, in reading the book, I, I know that luck and fortune was an area of great interest to Ingo, and it plays out in the book under the fate and destiny chapter. Yes. And so in looking kind of back at, you know, the fate, the Fortuna was the goddess of fortune and the personification of luck in Roman times. And her identity is kind of related to this, these chance events, but also tied to the idea of the strength of character, the Roman idea of strength of character. And so, for example, those who lacked virtues kind of invited ill fortune on themselves. So when distilled down, the quote we chose, the meaning is luck helps those who are brave. And we certainly see the university as just that, you know, brave to stand amongst the tide and continue to push the dialogue in this field we thought this quote was the perfect way to tie all three things together. You know, Ingo, the book, and the university. Well, Ingo wrote Psychic Literacy in 1989, and he passed away in 2013. Why do you think he didn't publish this book at any time during the 24-year period? And why do you think he wrote Psychic Literacy in the first place? Hmm. Well, we have found lots and lots of versions of this book, and many were were much broader and far more varied. I mean, it was his, it went in a lot of different directions. And out of these other versions came Ingo's reality boxes, the wisdom category, even his two secrets of power books. Although um, he wouldn't write those until a decade later, but out of the version now published, you can see the beginnings of his thoughts on, on um, ideas that he would see developed in his book that is published, your Nostradamus factor. You know, my personal opinion is that somehow he knew the book would have a time and place in 1989 was probably not that time or place. I mean, he kept the type pages of this book above his desk in a box. And so it was, you know, right above looking, you could look up and see it. So it's never out of mind. We could not, we couldn't find any indication that he tried to publish it. So I'm not really sure. I, I think he was, he was working on another unpublished manuscript right after this called The Astrology of Serial Killers. And he did try to get that published. So, you know, certainly trying to get psychic literacy published was an avenue available to him, Mm -hmm. but he he didn't take it. Um, But, you know, the editor of the book, Brian Lord, the one who kind of uncovered it, is a grad student at the University of West Georgia. He's the one who encouraged us to publish it. He edited it. He designed it. He said this to us. He said, you know, 2018 was kind of when we began the process is the book Saturn Return. 
and that's, you know, an astrological term. And uh, kind of summed up is it kind of lasts two and a half to three years. And it's when Saturn returns to the same spot astrologically as when you were born. And it's known as kind of the cosmic rite of passage. You know, during this time, you have to face your own blocks in life, situations, things that will force you to make change if you're not doing what you're supposed to be doing. And if you refuse to heed these lessons and are not changing what you should be doing, I found this quote online, Saturn will bring a drill sergeant style smackdown. So, you know, a lot of divorces happen during this time, career changes and so on. And so it's also kind of like when you have to become an adult, um, so to speak. And maybe he knew this book had an age, you know, that it was it needed to find its feet now instead of in 1989. And perhaps that's why he never tried to get it published, but kept it in sight and left it behind for us, the next generation. We are almost out of time this segment, but we have time for one more question. What was it like having the great psychic, the father of remote viewing as an uncle? And tell us what it was like living with him. Oh, my gosh. He was, well, I think you read in, the, in that I was many things, right? His research oh, assistant, course, yes. dishwasher, right? Yeah. Well, well. Right? Um, <laughs> fax machine assistant, fax machine worker, what, what have you. So he is an extraordinary individual, but he was actually a very kind and compassionate he sure soul. Was. Um, mm-hmm. And he could, he could entertain royalty and he could talk with the homeless on the street for hours at a time. He it really made no difference to him. He was really fascinated by people of all kinds and related to people of all kinds. And um, when I first went to live with him, I was scared to death of him. Right? Why? I didn't know what right? I was like, well, he was very, he was very, he could be, look very stern. Oh, yeah. Um, right. But he really wasn't. And we had so much fun together. We watched movies together. We read together. It was always my job to read back whatever he had just written. We had great dialogues. And in fact, it was he and his literary agent at the time who um, actually set, it was the literary agent's son um, that my uncle set us up. And in and, and using astrology initially to pair us together. And we, we met once five years ago. I mean, five years from the time it was the first time I lived with him in 1991. They tried setting us up. It didn't work, but he was never just heard because he felt like we were the right match. And in, in five years after that, in 1996, they tried again and it worked. We met at the end of uh, October, had our first date at the end of November, and were engaged to be married at the end of December. So I guess he knew his stuff. Well, I think I know he knew his stuff. And as a matter of fact, I wouldn't be surprised if he's with us tonight. As we have, especially during all, all this kind of revelation of his book, I think he might be. But right now we got to take a break because rules and regulations 506 of the penal code state that that's what happens when on the radio. I want to thank you for joining us. I wish we had more time, but such is not the case for now. Maybe we can do it again, huh? It sounds great. Thank you. Thank you, Ellie. God bless you, dear. Hello. This is Ingo Swan, the author of Penetration, The Question of Extraterrestrial and Human Telepathy. And you're listening to the wonderful 21st Century Radio with the amazing Dr. Bob Hieronymus. Our guest for this next segment is Blynn Oliveri, Head of Special Collections at the University of West Georgia's Library. As an academic librarian, Blynn manages rare book and archival collections, which include extensive holdings on the topic of human consciousness, with particular focus on remote viewing, near-death experiences, and holistic human experiences. The University of West Georgia is a public university in the metro Atlanta area, and in 2013, the estate of Ingo Swan presented Ingo's archives to the university, and Blynn will tell us about some of the amazing discoveries they have made in these archives, including the unknown book we are discussing tonight, Psychic Literacy and the Coming Psychic Renaissance. Welcome to 21st Century Radio, Blynn. Thank you, Dr. Anonymous. It's great to be here. 
It's great to, <laughs> to hear from you again. It's been a while, though. I remember meeting you at Philip K. Dix Film Festival in New York City. Uh, that was a few years ago for That's a screening right. of the unfinished documentary about Ingo. And I'm so glad to finally have you as a guest on our radio show tonight. I wish it would be for longer, but we can't do that. I understand you had just recently been hired at the University of West Georgia when Ingo Swan archives came to your attention. These archives were one of the first you were responsible for collecting. Please tell us about your trip to Ingo's home at 357 Bowery in New York. What was that like? Uh, well, it was such a great moment for me. I had um, been in charge of, of manuscript, archival, and, and printed book collections before, and coming to the University of West Georgia with a collection focus on parapsychology, this was really my first encounter with um, making a choice, an acquisition choice, about a parapsychology collection. So that was quite a moment to kind of be in these talks with Ellie and her mom, Merlene Ryder, and to have the opportunity to go up uh, to Ingo's um, apartment in the Bowery and to look at the materials in situ. And um, as I as I walked up the stairs and, and behind the gate and met Ellie and Merlene, there were pennies strewn all over the steps. Uh oh. <laughs> before you got to his front door. <laughs> and I didn't know about the significance of, of pennies and how Ingo left leaves money for people. So I was sort of like, wow, <laughs> so this is quite something. I haven't seen this, you know, walking around Manhattan before. Um, and then walking in and up the stairs to his flat, it, I, it was quite a moment to see how he lived and to see um, primarily on that level his his library and then going down into his art basement in the basement and, and seeing um, his canvases and artwork around, you know, his furniture, his desk, his tchotchkes, uh, to see more books and to really go deep into looking at what we're in, particularly, I remember looking at the SRI binders and their SRI files from when um, Ingo worked at the Stanford Research Institute. And I picked up one of the binders, and the page that it fell open to was Mount Rainier, uh, which is a mountain I'm very familiar with. And it just, it's like, it, there was just a lot of, of, of synergy um, about about that moment of, of encountering Ingo's papers. And I, I absolutely was convinced of their research value and their appropriateness for coming here to the University of West Georgia. So I got very, very excited. Yeah, well, the University of West Georgia doesn't seem to be a place one would expect to find collections about psychic and paranormal experiences. How did the university come to have these materials? Yeah, I think Ellie um, alluded to that a bit earlier with um, Dr. William G. Roll, Bill Roll, as you know him, Bill. Uncle Bill. Well, Uncle Bill. So uh, <laughs> Bill came to serve on faculty um, in 1986 here. And also what came with him was the Psychical Research Foundation Library, Oh. So Bill came down to you know serve his academic appointment here within the Department of Psychology. The library special collections had this book transfer that was associated with that. And then Bill started depositing his papers here and and we already had a corpus about humanistic psychology which looks at the human holistically. And as a multi-dimensional sort of experience, not just you know a behavioral thing. Mm -hmm. um, and so the humanistic psychology program really had very close roots to the parapsychology program for those kind of exceptional experiences that humans have. And um, so we started collecting. Um, and, and broadening what our humanistic psychology collections were to serve Dr. Roll and the expanding faculty and students who were studying in the Department of Psychology. 
And we have ended up, um, as a result, after years of this work, really probably having one of the strongest um, parapsychology, human consciousness, um, humanistic psychology collections in the United States. That's, that's fantastic. I'm saying it's fantastic because my doctorate is in humanistic psychology and personal psychology under Dr. Stanley Krippner. Oh, yes. And that was five and a half years of, of some situation. If you know Stan, uh, he's a pretty tough guy. Yeah. Wonderful guy, but he's tough. I know two ways about it. Um, well, could you tell us about the moment when the manuscript for psychic literacy was discovered in Ingo's archives? And when did you realize that, that you had the manuscript for an entire book? Whoa. <laughs> well, we started... Um processing Ingo's papers really at the point that they started coming in in 2013. And Ingo's papers were extensive, and we have his book collection. Um, so that's over 1,600 books just in his book collection. And his papers measure out at over 187 boxes. So it was really a uh, it's really a process and sort of a management um, process to um, look at those papers, arrange them. Ingo had immaculately arranged his books. We rehoused things into archival folders and archival boxes, and then had to decide: okay, what grouping of materials is going to come first? Is it going to be the alphabetical files? Is it going to be the correspondence files? You know, is it going to be the SRI files? Is it going to be his manuscripts? And we sort of tackled the low-hanging fruit first that was already really well arranged by Ingo. And the uh, volume of research files and manuscripts in Ingo's papers is enormous. And in the process of reviewing and housing and arranging and describing his manuscripts and research files, we came across a number of unpublished manuscripts or manuscripts that were titled something and then got reshaped, you know, to be part of his other books, like mm -hmm. Purple Fables, for example. Oh, yeah. yeah. And um, so with psychic literacy, that was actually one of the latter pieces of Ingo's research and manuscript files. And so in February of 2018, uh, a graduate student who was working on processing that, Brian Lord, um, came to me and he's like, you know, this is really a fantastic manuscript. He's like, I could not help myself but to stop and read it. And this manuscript doesn't appear to have been published at all or, you know, it didn't manifest itself in one of Ingo's other books, and that he felt very strongly that it was one of the most excessively written books that Ingo produced. And Ingo is a phenomenal writer. Oh, he's a sure phenomenal is. writer. I can't believe, I mean, he was such an incredible person to be this amazing artist and amazing author and such a wonderful, warm person with so many connections. I mean, he was really um, brilliant, right? Oh, he was double brilliant. <laughs> and, yeah. and psychic literacy is, um, w it just shines out. Um, and, and we actually have a letter that Ingo wrote uh, to a Dr. McConnell in February 1991 that sort of explains um, this manuscript, in fact, in an earlier iteration, it was called the Inside Psychic, um, which never gelled, he said, but rather a manuscript psychic literacy did. I have been unsuccessful in obtaining a publisher for it. And so, like Ellie said earlier, I think that this very special manuscript, it just, it had to have sort of the era where it could emerge, and now is that time. Mm -hmm. You know, I know who would have published it. Tell Inter me, Dr. Hieronymus. Inner Traditions International would have loved it. Yeah. They would have loved it. Yeah. Uh, but, you know, the, he, I think he, 
no, I, I shouldn't speculate this like this, but I, I believe that, that he knew what he was doing and he maybe thought that this was the, a better time. Later was a better time for the opening and especially when you take a look at what's happening politically in our world. I think it's, it is, is just in time for others to take this work very seriously. Yeah, I absolutely agree with you. And interestingly, earlier in that letter with Dr. McConnell, you know, he said that um, he was talking about sort of the debate about psy or parapsychology. And he says that the debate is not a scientific matter, but rather one of a peculiar socio-philosophical, perhaps even political um, kind of debate. Mm Mm-hmm. And what I find meaningful in that is that um, Inga was really looking at information and significance and about the boundaries of how people are literate about um, what happens with extraordinary experiences. And, you know, in a passage in Psychic Literacy, he talks about literacy being a network of background information that enables one to sort of read and observe with adequate levels of comprehension and to understand more than just the apparent surface meanings. And so he talks about this sort of information plus significance laid on that. And that, I think, is one of the most um, important things about psychic literacy is it's being aware of what is going around around you, being ob- observant and and sensitive, and looking at other ways that that the world and the universe is communicating with you, and you're communicating with it, and it's part of it, um, without having the boundaries of like well, this must be scientifically tested or, you know, putting it all in boxes that sort of, that that in in fact truly limit your experience of being alive. We have time for one more question, and that is, tell us about Ingo Swan's research fellowship, please. Oh, yeah. We are so excited um, to have this. Um, Thanks to the generosity of the Swan Writer Productions, We have the opportunity to bring a scholar here um, every other year uh, to conduct research and to give a public lecture. And the purpose of this Ingo Swan Research Travel Fellowship is to support use of the papers for scholarly and creative purposes. And the first fellowship was awarded in 2018 to Dr. Derek Lee, Um, who is at Penn State up in Pennsylvania. And he is studying the connections between um, uh, literature, uh, 21st century literature, and um, particularly remote viewing and the military applications um, of remote viewing. And it's a wonderful opportunity to, to have people here, to have them use all of our uh, parapsychology collections and to stimulate greater research into this because we have so many scholars and students and members of the general public who come in to use our collections uh, for a multiplicity of purposes um, to make art, to, um, you know, learn more about how to do their own remote viewing, um, to learn more about themselves, to learn about how remote viewing, you know, was part of a Cold War era approach um, to dealing with Russian intelligence. Oh, sure. That well. So, yeah, it's, it's a wonderful thing. And our next cycle is in 2020. So in March of 2020, we'll announce um, the application period for the fellowship again. Oh, that sounds great. Boy, I wish, again, I wish we had more time, and I would like to do another show about for a couple, a couple hours just on this in this particular. I would like, we would like to obviously make an a, a economic uh, donation to uh, what you're doing down there. But I also thought of possibly, uh, would you accept my doctoral thesis? 
Absolutely. We'd well, love that. It's a historic analysis. <laughs> Dr. Hieronymus would be an honor. <laughs> it's called, uh, it's an, an historic analysis of the reverse of the America's Great Seal and its relationship to the ideology of humans that can transpersonal psychology. And, Wonderful. And that's why it took so long. Because, <laughs> because It should have been done long before, but I'm glad no one else did it or else I would have done it for nothing. Oh, it is time to go. It is time to go. Thank you for joining us, Blynn Olivieri. After this break, we'll be joined by retired Lieutenant Colonel Thomas McNear, Ingo Swan's best remote viewing student, to tell us more about what's inside this newly discovered book by the great Ingo Swan called Psychic Literacy. You can find it on Amazon or Ingo Swan. Uh, dot com or wherever books are sold you can visit the west georgia college special collections online at www.westga.edu forward slash library forward slash special dash collections where you'll find information on and about ingo swan's fellowship and much more well welcome back to 21st century radio Our guest for the remainder of the program is retired Lieutenant Colonel Thomas McNear, a student of Ingo Swan and a member of the Army Psychic Spying Program known today as Stargate. Ingo described Tom McNear as, quote, his best student ever, end quote, in addition to being the first member trained in remote viewing by Ingo Swan, Tom was actually the only member that Ingo trained in all the stages of remote viewing. He is joining us tonight to tell us what is in this newly discovered book, Psychic Literacy and the Coming Psychic Renaissance, written by his mentor over 30 years ago. Welcome to 21st Century Radio, Tom McNear. Thank you, Dr. Bob. How's your pitching arm tonight, Tom? How's my pitching arm? Yeah, is it doing well? Well, I heard the title of your thesis, and I was wondering, did you develop an acronym to go along with that? <laughs> I didn't. I <laughs> that didn't. was a long one. Well, you know, trying to translate America's symbols when our government didn't even know what they meant is kind of sad, and I had to go through that experience. I couldn't believe it. Um, that's the reason why I decided to pick it out, because uh, there was a side to it on the reverse of the Great Seal, the pyramid, the iron, the triangle. That was a spirit, very spiritual side. Now, that's been totally misunderstood by uh, individuals today that are into conspiracy theory, that are just trying to say this is satanic, this is the devil, this is hell, etc. And I believe they're wrong, Thomas. But, Tom, before we get started on the book, let's start with more about who you are. Please tell us a little bit about yourself and how you came to know Ingo Swan. Sure. I grew up in Virginia. My dad was a NASA researcher. I was an Army intelligence officer in uniform for 22 years. And after retiring from active duty, I spent almost 22 more as an Army civilian intelligence officer. Thank you. I finally retired January of this year after almost 44 years. My congratulations and thank you for serving. Well, thank you. It's absolutely important. How did I get started in all of this? Well, when we were in the officer's intelligence course at Fort Huachuca in 1981, I know that's quite a few years back now, we were given what was described as a general psychological test ascertain the psychological profile of the average intelligence officer. Well, that's what we were told. Actually, the test sought to identify personality types the Army believed would make a good psychic. I maxed the test, and a friend of mine, Rob Coward, also did very well. So they brought us in and briefed us on the program and asked us if we would be willing to join the Army's psychic spying program that your listeners know is Stargate. We both accepted the challenge, and we moved to Fort Meade, Maryland. Ingo Swan and Dr. Hal Putoff, and I know most of your listeners have heard of Hal, at Stanford Research Institute in California, developed a program to train intelligence personnel in something known as remote viewing. Remote viewing is the ability to perceive information about a location inaccessible to our normal five senses due to distance, or shielding, or time. I'm sure you and your listening audience knows about remote viewing. My friend and training partner, Rob Cowart, 
and I met Ingo Swan in 1981 at SRI to begin our training. We met twice for two-week periods, but then Rob became ill and was medically retired from the Army. So after that point, it was just Ingo and me. I was the first member, as you said, of the program that he trained and the only person he trained in all of the different stages. So for more than a three-year period, I spent much of my time with Ingo, initially in California, but then we, init the, we eventually went to the SRI offices in New York City, which was closer to Ingo's home. That made him happy. It's funny, Rob and I were initially a bit nervous about meeting the great psychic Mr. Ingo Swan. Years later, Ingo told me that he was terrified of meeting us at that first meeting. <laughs> he said he didn't know what to expect from career Army officers. We had a good laugh about that. And during that three-plus years, Ingo and I developed an abiding friendship, which continued until his death in 2013. Wow, so you were one of the original members of the Army's psychic, spy, psychic spying program known today as Stargate. You left Stargate in '85. After almost four years with the program, what did you do next? Well, as you said, I left the program in 1985. At that point, the program is in transition. It was going to become part of the Defense Intelligence Agency. And I felt that was a good time for me to move on with my Army career. After leaving the program, I spent 12 years in uniform. We spent six years in Europe. For three of those, I was responsible for a counter-espionage team that neutralized eight individuals who were spying against the U.S. And for another three, I was assigned to NATO, Allied Forces Central Europe, where I deployed to the former Yugoslavia as part of the peacekeeping force there. I really enjoyed military life. My career took me to 49 states. 19 European countries, so it kept me busy. We moved 18 times in 22 years. 18 times. That, that's probably not a world record, though, right? <laughs> probably not. <laughs> that's a, quite a tradition that goes on with that. Uh, did you enjoy reading this book, Knowing Ingo, the way you did? Oh, very much. Um, but before we go too far, I'd like to say this book is so deep and so insightful um, it will be difficult to address it in less than two years. There's just uh, two hours. There's just so much contained in it. You got that. I encourage listeners to pick up the book and read it themselves. One other thing. Ingo used a very technical term in this book. The term is psychic stuff. Psychic <laughs> stuff. That's pretty Ingo technical. Ingo said he wanted readers to better understand psychic stuff. So let's start talking about some of that. Yeah, how about that? In, in the introduction to this book, Colin Wilson, the author of more than a hundred books on the occult, yeah. wrote of the difficulty of fitting a mass of bewildering facts into a unified picture. Even the simplest subjects proved to be far more complicated than he assumed. And this is what Ingo has attempted in psychic literacy. In it, Ingo is trying to create a unified picture of all the psychic stuff that he knew about. In 1974, Ingo went to Washington, D.C. He proposed a governmental two-year scientific study to collect and evaluate all sorts of psychic stuff to try and assemble that unifying picture of facts and beliefs and legends, myths and theories. He said even scientists needed to think from a common-sense platform. He was surprised that they approved a three-year study instead of the two-year that he had proposed. But he said by the middle of the second year, though, a dismal realization set in. All the facts taken together were not going to make sense, especially to those who didn't want to believe or understand. The group sat around a large table brainstorming, he said, and the idea of psychic linkages gradually emerged. The thing all psychic phenomena have in common is that they function as links between the human mind-body organism and something else. Intuition links the person to something they need to know. Clairvoyance is a link to distant places, events, and times. Telepathy is a link between people 
and other things, living things. Precognition and prophecy are links with the future. Postcognition are links with the past. Psychokinesis are links with energies and other things. Apparitions are links to other dimensions. And dreams and visions are linked to the unconscious. Ingo said the flaw with parapsychology was that psychic phenomena were considered things in and of themselves, when actually they are the result of linkages. That was a totally new idea that came from this study. Telepathy and clairvoyance are not things in themselves. They are psychic linkages, and what we see is the result of these linkages. Ingo said there is little evidence psychic crafts in themselves can be responsible for accurately predicting the future. When we see something through some psychic ability, what we are looking at is the result of some psychic process. Ingo also talked about modern information theory, and that was the direction Hal Putoff, Dr. Hal Putoff took. We'll have to stop there, Tom, and we'll be back after uh, hit the top of the hour in the news, and we'll return. We're talking with Tom McNair, considered the best student of psychic Ingo Swan, joining us to talk about the posthumously published Swan manuscript called Psychic Literacy and the Coming Psychic Renaissance. Swan hyphen writer productions. Order the book from Amazon or ingoswan.com. Well, welcome back to 21st Century Radio. I'm what's left of Dr. Bob Hieronymus, your host and our executive producer and research assistant, Laura Cortner. She's big boss around here. Our engineer tonight is Anita Brockentine, and she knows how fast to run this train tonight. We are continuing this hour with our special first ever interview on a brand new book discovered in the archives of the late great Ingo Swan, who passed on in 2013. Last hour, we heard from Ellie Flippin, Ingo's niece and representative for his estate, and Blyn Oliveri, the head archivist at the West Georgia College Library of Special Collections, the home of Ingo Swan's paper. This hour, we continue with Ingo's... I am so proud to say this, because I've always wanted to talk to this guy some more. Uh, hour, we continue with Ingo Swan's best student in the remote viewing program, retired Lieutenant Colonel Thomas McNear, a veteran of the military psychic spy training program called Stargate. Welcome back, Tom. Thank you, Dr. Bob. Before the break, we finished up with psychic linkages. No, I think but you had an important point coming here. Okay. And that is Ingo also talked about modern information theory in this book. And that's the theory that all information is available to all of us all the time. Some call it the Akashic Record or Young's Collective Unconscious. I'm sure you've heard of those, Dr. Bob. Yes, sir. But Ingo says if we put psychic linkages together with this modern information theory, a new day of human psychic endeavor has begun. This is the psychic renaissance that Ingo is seeking with this book. And he says the precursor for this, the necessary precursor for this, is psychic literacy. And that's, that's why he entitled the book that way. I'm hoping when we finish tonight that I will have whetted the listener's appetite and shared some of what Ingo knew. Ingo talked about a lot in psychic literacy. And he supports his, view, his views with compelling examples and scientifically supported evidence. And that's the, the strength of this book. I strongly encourage interested listeners to pick it up and read it. You asked if I enjoyed reading it. What I enjoyed most about reading Psychic Literacy was Ingo's narrative writing style in this book. Ingo has written more than 14 books, but in this book more than any other, he's written it as he speaks. I felt like I was sitting on his couch and conversing with him. Anyone who spent any time with Ingo will immediately recognize his voice in this book. Well, that's for sure. So uh, part the book is broken into two parts. Part one is entitled Background Information. Part two is entitled Psychic Literacy. The background information was provided for the many doubters out there, which I, I'm so glad he did this, uh, or, or what my Ingo might have called the psychic illiterates. Tell us, I used to be a psychic illiterate. <laughs> I, 
did. I grew up a little bit, though. Tell us a few. Tell us about a few of the many excellent historic examples he provided as background that are most remarkable. He went into many. I'll go into some of the keys. But, Dr. Bob, I know there aren't any doubters in your listening audience. Oh, sure there are. <laughs> That's why we're on the air. <laughs> Ingo went into great detail on many legendary and historically well-documented seers. Ingo saw the first section of this book as his opportunity to convince the doubters. He sought to do this by providing facts, well-researched and well-documented facts that most doubters had never seen. He went into many, but let me just hit a, the high points of a few. Yes, sir. Um, he began with Nostradamus. Now, we've all heard of Nostradamus. He was born in 1503. But we've only, we only have a vague idea of what he said. Nostradamus foresaw the French Revolution in extreme detail over 200 years before it occurred. Mm -hmm. He called it the advent of the common people. He stated, the white bourbon will be driven out, made prisoner, led to the guillotine on a dung cart, his feet tied together, and killed. Well, that's pretty detailed. 227 years later, Louis XVI, who was known as the white bourbon because he was from the House of Bourbon, more than eight generations after Nostradamus made the prediction, Louis was, in fact, tied to a two-wheeled dung cart, led to the guillotine, and killed. Pretty detailed. Very. Ingo points out many other remarkable details of Nostradamus, but just too many for tonight. Next, he talked about Count Louis Harmon, who at the age of 11 wrote a book on palm reading. He was a clairvoyant, a palmist, and an astrologer. He accurately predicted the beginning of and the reasons for World War II, and the eventual establishment of the State of Israel. Interestingly, Harmon predicted that British King Edward would abdicate the throne of England, allowing his younger brother to become king. Less than a year after becoming king, Edward did ab abdicate the throne, so he could marry his American girlfriend, Wallace Simpson. Now, the interesting thing here. Harmon predicted this 11 years before it occurred and six years before Edward even met his girlfriend, Wallace Simpson. Wow. Next is Evangeline Adams. She was an astrologer, and, and this is interesting. She was hauled into court as a fortune teller. Rather than, than allowing her lawyer to have the case thrown out, she wanted it brought to trial so she could prove once and for all the efficacy of astrology. The judge ruled in her favor and said that he, that, quote, she had raised the astrology to the dignity of an exact science. That was back in 1914. And then there's Jean Dixon, born in 1904. Now, I know most of your listeners have heard of Jean Dixon. Her public image was somewhat tainted by articles about her in the tabloids, but she had many remarkable predictions. She correctly predicted the death of Carol Lombard and Dag Hammarskjöld in plane crashes. How could she have known that? She also predicted the assassination of Mahatma Gandhi and the suicide of Marilyn Monroe. But her most remarkable prediction was that the assassination of President John F. Kennedy. Listen closely. 1952. Eleven years before it happened, Dixon predicted Kennedy's assassination. Kennedy didn't get elected for another nine years, and her prediction was so well documented, it was published in Parade magazine seven years before it happened. <clears throat> and as the day drew near, Dixon reached out through her circle of friends to try and warn the president, but to no avail. One of her friends said, what could we do? We Americans simply haven't the capacity to embrace something like this. She said, I knew the Kennedys would consider it some kind of mumbo-jumbo and the president would have laughed at the mere suggestion. Well, who's laughing now? Yeah. This is the very psychic illiteracy that Ingo addresses in this book. 
Dixon's prediction of Kennedy's assassination was made 11 years prior to it happening, and it was published in publications, and many people tried to raise the threat. A classic case of psychic illiteracy. These are just some of the key historical examples Ingo used to substantiate psychic functioning over the last 500 years. He went into a great deal more detail that was amazing and fun to read. But you get the point. Indeed. Psychic stuff has been with us for hundreds of years, for thousands of years. You want to touch on Abraham Lincoln? Abraham Lincoln. Talk about hitting things right on the head. There was no, it was very obvious uh, that Lincoln knew what was going to happen. And, of course... Uh, well, actually, there were three assassinations that Ingo addresses in this book. The first was Julius Caesar. Julius Caesar's wife had dreamt that he was going to be assassinated when he went into the Senate the next day. And supposedly his soothsayers also said to him that you shouldn't go. But he didn't listen to any of them. He was not observant, and he was murdered, and the rest is history. A few days before Abraham Lincoln was assassinated, he had a dream. He was walking around in the White House in his dream, and everywhere he went, people were mourning and sobbing, he said. In the East Room, he saw a corpse clothed in funeral vestments. In his dream, he asked the soldier, who lies dead in the White House? The soldier replied, the president. He was assassinated. The afternoon before he was shot, Lincoln's cabinet entered the council room to find him with his head buried in his hands, and Lincoln said to them, gentlemen, before long you will have some important news. Lincoln was assassinated five hours later. And then finally, you know, I talked about Gene Dixon's prediction. Now, if you read in Parade Magazine that you were going to be killed in seven years, don't you think that would get your attention? Well, sir. Wouldn't you want to do something about it? Yes, sir. But as they said, that they didn't think anyone would believe that psychic mumbo-jumbo stuff. Again, classic psychic illiteracy. Ingo says if we pay attention to the psychic alerts that we get, and then if we seek additional information from some of the other psychic arts and crafts, we can perhaps change these events. And he he did it himself, though, too, didn't he? Didn't he change events? events that, that one yes, he did. Be? Let me talk about some of those. Yeah. Ingo discussed several of his personal events when Ingo was six, he and his parents lived in a small house next to his grandmother's much larger house. His room was off the kitchen. And one night, just as he was going to sleep, and he emphasized he wasn't yet asleep, he saw a wall of flame erupt in the kitchen and burst through the door into his room, searing the wallpaper off the boards and incinerating the skin from his body. He ran screaming into his parents' bedroom. There was, of course, no fire. His father checked the kitchen and the rest of the house and tried to convince Ingo to return to bed, but Ingo screamed and yelled and wouldn't stay in the house. He added that he could be quite a feisty little brat. Yeah. To quiet him down, Ingo and his parents spent the night at his grandparent, at his grandmother's house. That night, about midnight, their little house burst into flames, and before the fire department could get there, a mere three blocks away, the kitchen, bedrooms, and the dining room were all gone. Mm -hmm. His uncle witnessed the explosion, and he said the house just suddenly burst into flames like a bomb had gone off. Ingo said that the uncle got a little toasted trying to save them because he didn't know that they were sleeping next door. Ingo said they never figured out what caused the fire, but he makes two points from this event. First, if his parents had been able to intellectually convince him to go back to bed, they may have all perished in the fire. Indeed. And secondly, interestingly, Ingo believes they changed the future that included them getting incinerated. Clearly, his intuition and his premonition had saved their lives. Years later, when Ingo was living in New York City, 
He said he loved to walk the streets of New York listening to his Walkman. Wagner was his favorite. Yeah. Well, one day Ingo was walking along, he said, his ears filled with Wagnerian delirium. When he got to the curb, he was about to step off when he heard over the loudly playing Wagner, Stop! He said he was astonished, and he stopped right in his tracks, leg in the air. One second later, a speeding car shot past him, the police car in pursuit. He said had he stepped into the road, he would surely have been run over. He looked around to see who might have yelled stop to him, but there was no one there. He was alone. He said he meekly rewound the tape a bit to see if the word stop was on the tape, but it wasn't. His intuition had again saved his life. He said that was the end of Wagner in the Street. Wow, indeed. And that was the end of this segment on 21st Century Radio. We go to a break with our guest, retired Lieutenant Colonel Tom McNair, considered the best student of psychic Ingo Swan. And we'll be back in just a few minutes. So you've been telling us a few many excellent historical examples and what also had provided as background that were most remarkable because, as you know from what I've read in the book, Ringo was very, very much upset about how astrology had been ignored, uh, etc., for, for such a long time. And, um, and, I, and I'm so glad that he was able to express it that way. I mean, truly angry about this because it hurts. It hurts the consciousness of not only those who are living today, uh, but those in the future, if it continues that way. So, um, did you have any other examples you wanted to talk about? With the with about the few historical examples, as he uh, mentioned yeah, as a background? used an example from his own life that he didn't heed the warning. Yeah. He said that he was visiting family in Texas in 1988, and on the way back to the airport, his sister was riding with him in the car. He said she was not yet 50 years old and appeared to be healthy, but on the ride to the airport, Ingo suddenly got the impression that she was going to die. Oh, my. He said he put this thought in some dark recess of his swampy intellect, but he says as he was tucking his imagination away, his sister mentioned she had been experiencing migraine headaches. Now, quoting from the book, Now you'd think that with all I am saying I know about psychic stuff, I might have put two and two together on the spot, and instead of catching my plane, might have diverted us all to the nearest hospital to get her a checkup. End quote. But alas, he did not. He said he knew his family would have ignored him, so he let it go. Mm -hmm. Four months later, completely unexpectedly, his sister died instantly of a massive brain aneurysm. Oh, yeah. He said, we need to pay attention to these warnings that we receive from our psychic alerting system. He said maybe a health exam could have identified her aneurysm and perhaps saved her life. Well, wonderfully about this book, at the end of each chapter, Ingo includes what he calls practical exercises. And this is a how-to-be-psychic self-help book, in a way. But should the reader of psychic literacy expect to be a psychic, or, or at least more psychic, after reading the book? No, that was the, wasn't the intent of this book. I didn't write the book. So I try and read from from it as much as possible, and I'm trying to get myself organized here so that I can say what Ingo said about it. Yeah, well, I appreciate your taking the time to do that. It's very important because he wanted want us all to be as accurate as possible. That's the way he was. Yeah, he said um, that the purpose of this book was not to make the reader a psychic. The goal of this book was and the practical exercises at the end of each chapter is to make the reader psychically literate. And that's the key. And better able to recognize and understand the psychic ocean in which we live. 
like fish in the ocean, fail to recognize the water around them, those who are psychically illiterate fail to acknowledge the psychic ocean in which we live our lives. Only by achieving psychic literacy will we be open to what Ingo calls this psychic alerting system. This is the alerting system which lets us know that something is coming. And then we can use, learn to use the psychic arts and crafts that he addresses in this book. Psychic literacy, he said, will enable us to benefit and will allow mankind to benefit from the valuable, life-changing psychic information that's all around us. Indeed, it is all around us. Understanding the ocean of psychic information will help us to understand and use our own psychic potentials. So if somebody wants to look for a Ingo Swan how-to book, I would recommend Everybody's Guide to Natural ESP, Unlocking the Extrasensory Power of Your Mind. It's also available at ingoswan.com and that, on the Amazon site. Yeah, that's an excellent start, book. But start with psychic literacy to gain that background that Ingo says is so necessary to improve our own psychic skills. Uh, we, my wife, Dr. Queen Zahar, I call her Dr. Queen Zahar, uh, did that interview with on that book with uh, Ingo maybe 15 years ago, something like that. Thanks for bringing that up. Did Ingo believe we all possess psychic abilities? Indeed he did. Ingo stated, all humans have clairvoyant sensing facilities. This is the reason they keep emerging in spite of societal resistance to them. He strongly believed we all possess some level of psychic awareness. Our, our abilities are suppressed, though, by our psychic illiteracy. This is one of the primary reasons he wrote the book. He talked about the three different types of psychic experiences. We have the spontaneous psychic experience, which is totally unexpected. It comes out of nowhere. Then there's the inadvertent one, which is similar to the spontaneous, except it's accompanied by something like hypnosis or anesthesia or a near-death experience. And then the third are the deliberate events using the psychic arts and crafts that he talks about in this book. We've all had psychic spontaneous psychic experiences, walking down the road or driving home from work. A 1987 poll of Americans said that 67% have all said that they have experienced some form of psychic event. Sometimes we just know things that we couldn't possibly know if it wasn't for a psychic connection. And how many times have you heard about or read about someone having a life-changing experience on the operating table under anesthesia mm -hmm. or through a near-death experience. Oh, yeah. That's as far right. as the psychic arts and crafts, we can all make use of these skills to improve our connection with the invisible world. Some people are just more proficient than others. It's, we talk about a violin. We can all play a violin, right? Right. Well, initially, nobody wants to hear us, <laughs> with, practice, with practice, we get better. Right. But there are very few true virtuosos. Ingo was one of those virtuoso psychics. It's like that with psychic stuff. We can all do it. In fact, there's a well-recognized effect known as the first-time effect. Often inexperienced people knock it out of the park their first time or two, but then their abilities seem to level off until they gain necessary experience to really access the invisible realm. Mm -hmm. But yes, Ingo knew we're all capable, and he spent much of his life trying to help us all achieve our own psychic potentials. Well, thank heavens he did. Tom, what are your views on Ingo's psychic arts and crafts? Well, I believe that we all have these abilities, like Ingo. Um, I believe we all have the ability to sense beyond time and space, but in our humanness, we attempt to explain to others and to ourselves the source of this information. If I say, I had a vision of the future, people are going to have their doubts. 
But if I say, I saw the future in a crystal ball, that same person may have fewer doubts, because after all, I didn't have the vision, the crystal ball did. And there are many tools or vehicles we use for this, tarot cards, bee leaves, Ouija boards, spirit guides, crystal balls, palm reading, dreams. Many people find it difficult to believe that they can access this information on their own. It's easier to believe this information is coming from someplace else. Ingo humorously stated that psychic phenomena, by any other names, are still psychic phenomena. While remote viewing, most of us remote view with our eyes open, much as the crystal ball gazer looks into the crystal ball with his eyes open, or the tarot card reader reads the tarot with their eyes open. I believe we're all seeing the same picture. Now, this isn't new. In 1930, Rabindranath Tagore told Albert Einstein, this is interesting, the table I perceive is perceptible by the same kind of consciousness I possess. This means if we can see the table, we have eyes. If we can hear the table, we have ears. But if the table we perceive is in some distant galaxy, a million light years away, and we can still perceive it, then something in our consciousness allows us to do that. Carl Jung said that something in us sees around corners and knows beyond times and space. Um, I know you know Nancy Duterte. Oh, in yes. her book entitled Psychic Intuition, she cited that humans actually have 21 or 37 senses instead of the five that we generally recognize. For instance, the ability to sense magnetic fields or to see light waves beyond what is normally accepted, to see infrared waves and x-rays. After all, our physical eyes see less than 1% of the the electromagnetic spectrum. We also have the ability to hear frequencies beyond what's normally accepted, the 20 hertz to 20 kilohertz, because our physical ears hear less than 1% of the acoustic spectrum. And in discussions with Nancy, she says that someday we're going to know that there may be hundreds of senses that we have. And here's a good example. We can all see rainbows because of the conical receptors in our eyes. Animals don't have those, so animals can't see rainbows. The rainbow is there for the animals just as it's there for us. They just can't see it. So what don't our five physical senses know? that perhaps our psychic senses can know. Perhaps psychic individuals are simply using some of these other generally unrecognized senses to access information. Why limit ourselves to just the five? That's like describing a computer to somebody by telling them how it smells, or describing fire to someone by describing the way it tastes. Psychic arts and crafts that Ingo talks about in this book allow us to know so much more than limiting ourselves to just the five. Indeed. And people often ask me, well, where do these abilities come from? I believe these are all our God-given perceptions. The Bible says all things created in heaven and on earth, both seen and unseen, are created by God. God created all of us. If one of us can do this, all of us can do it. Now, we noted uh, the assassinations that he talks about, but also, do you think these assassinations could have been prevented if mankind had been more psychically literate at that time? Well, as I said, um, 67% of Americans say that they have had some sort of psychic experience, but... Because of psychic illiteracy, they don't know what to make of it. So like Ingo did with his sister when he got the perception that she might die, they just sort of tuck it away and ignore it. If we were all more psychically literate, we would be paying more attention to this. And, and I think in, in your humanistic view, I think you would realize that if we all 
had better access to this sorts of information, we could probably all get along much better. That's true. Uh, obviously, yes, it's true. It's another dimension of our being uh, that uh, that we are going to have a wonderful time, some of us rediscovering all over again. But let me ask you a question. How many times do you think humans are born? Just once? I believe we're born just once. The Bible says we're all we all have one life and one death. Okay. And I'm I'm a Christian so I strongly believe in that. So people say, Well what do you believe about reincarnation? Mm -hmm. You know, how can a, a three year old boy know something that a sixty seven year old man um did when he was alive. And that goes with this information theory or the Akashic record. That three-year-old boy may simply be accessing this information that's available to all of us all the time. And he is aware of what happened with that 67-year-old man. Um, but I don't believe in reincarnation either. Well, not all of us do, that's for sure, but I do. But we're going to take a break right now here on 21st Century Radio with our guest, retired Lieutenant Colonel Tom McNear. Order the book from Amazon.com. What is the book? Psychic Literacy and the Coming of Psychic Renaissance, Swan Rider Productions. So Ingo spent time discussing fate and destiny. He stated that they are, are terms from the Dark Ages that our scientific modern-day society has nearly ceased to use. Could you please tell us a little more about what Ingo said about fate and destiny? Sure. Um, as we discussed, Ingo's psychic alerting system provides us information, both constructive and destructive. Um, this is similar to the terms of destiny and fate. Ingo said many people use the term synonymously, but they are not. People are destined to succeed or destined to do great things in their lives. But conversely, people are born a bad seed or doomed to a tragic life. And this is fate. Ingo also goes into a great detail about the many, many psychic alerts that people received before the fateful sailing of the Titanic. It was oh, amazing. You'll have to read the book. Yeah. One of the questions I often get asked is, what did Ingo think about changing the future? I think that's a fascinating topic for all of us. And as we're winding down, I'd like to try and address that if possible. Of course, let's do that. It sounds very important. Yeah, this could be a subject for a much, much longer discussion. But Ingo's spontaneous psychic, psychic alerts alert us to information about the future that can lead us down different paths. But is that really changing the future? Well, on one hand, Ingo says that future events, or at least some parts of them, already exist someplace. He says it's unthinkable that anybody, even by psychic means, could see something that truly is not or doesn't exist anywhere, anytime. He said, how can anyone see something that is not? The future be feeds back to us through psychic seeing, allowing us to change it if we are smart enough, he says. He said, clearly this is key to the future. We can't change the past. Well, we probably can't change the past. And we can't change the present because by the time present time is present, it's too late to change it. Mm -hmm. Ingo adds that this concept makes a mess of what we think to be our present time-space continuum. On the other hand, though, Ingo says this raises the question of whether one can change the future. He said, yes. Yes, we can. If we learn to accept these psychic alerts and if they, we allow them to impress into our intellects, he says, by incorporating our intuition with our intellects, we can make use of the information our psychic alerting system is sending us. Is this changing the future? Well, I'll let you and your listeners decide. But if we foresee ourselves dying in a car accident on a Monday, 
and we don't drive on Monday. Did we just change the future or were we wrong? Here's an interesting personal example. Dr. Julia Mossbridge said that 15 to 30 percent of U.S. people have claimed to experience precognitive dreams. Well, on 25 January 1986, I had a precognitive dream. I dreamed that the Space Shuttle Challenger was going to explode shortly after takeoff. Three days later, on the 28th, it happened. What if I had called NASA and told them to postpone the flight because of my dream? Well, they would have ignored me. Yeah. What if a 1,000 people had phoned them? Well, they may have postponed the flight, but if you'll remember why the shuttle blew up, it was because the O-ring in the solid rocket booster was frozen. Oh. So imagine a 1,000 people phoned in, they canceled the flight, they inspect everything. By that time, the O-ring would no longer be frozen, they would reschedule a launch, and everything would have been just fine. So did we change the future? Or were we just wrong? I can tell you what NASA would have concluded. And one other brief example from the Stargate program. We developed information that we believed indicated there was going to be an assassination attempt of President Ronald Reagan as his motorcade was taking him to an upcoming event. We took this information to the Secret Service in Washington, D.C., and that's a story in itself. Um, we spent a better part of two days convincing them that the program was for real and that we weren't from Mars. Anyway, after we got their attention and they finally took us seriously, or sort of seriously, they decided not to cancel the event, but they did agree to reroute the motorcade and drive to the event by an alternate route. So the president was transported to the event by an alternate route, the event took place, he safely returned to the White House, end of story, no assassination attempt. So did we prevent that assassination attempt, or were we just wrong? Again, you can guess what the Secret Service probably thought. Yeah, what, are the, what do you think they sir, would say? What do I think? Yeah. Um, well, if you go with what Ingo says, and that is, we can't see something that is not. We, remote viewers, saw an event that um, where the president was going to be attacked in his motorcade. I believe we saw something that could have been in a different future. But because they took him by a different route, it didn't happen. Well... Well, I've got so many questions in front of me, and we've just got about five or six minutes left. So uh, I'd rather let you talk about what you want to talk about that's more important than anything else we have my written, been written down here. Well, let's talk about psychic literacy. Okay. And... Is Ingo happy with where we are as mankind today? In many areas, Ingo was always ahead of his time. Ingo wrote Psychic Literacy in 1989, but I believe he was still ahead of where we are today. Mm -hmm. He understood the need for a new psychic synthesis, he called it, because he said that once we reach this new psychic synthesis, psychic functioning will finally show itself in the parapsychology labs, and people will finally believe it, and will finally be able to make use of this psychic alerting system. Etzel Cardinia, a psychology professor at Lund University, analyzed 10 classes of experiments exploring psychic effects, and he wrote, the evidence for psi is comparable to that for established phenomena in psychology and other disciplines. And Dr. Jessica Utz from UC Irvine said the data in support of precognition and possibly other related phenomena are quite strong statistically and would be widely accepted if they pertain to something more mundane. In other words, 
anything except for psychic stuff. But Ingo writes, and I quote here, yet a pompous, psychically illiterate, intellectual few can propose that the whole is nonsense and not an inconsiderable amount of anti-psychic stereotyped fanatics actually believe them, end quote. Mm -hmm. He added that, yes, he is angry. He called it anti-psychic nonsense. So I believe Ingo is disappointed at how little progress mankind has made. He stated this clearly in this book, that until we truly understand the history of psychic stuff, we will not achieve psychic literacy. And without psychic literacy, mankind will continue to be ignorant of the psychic alerting system and the psychic arts and crafts that can change our lives and the future of mankind itself. So, no, I don't think we're there yet. I think Ingo's a little disappointed in it. But tonight I'm hoping I've piqued the interest of your listeners. I encourage them to pick up the book and read it for themselves. It's truly amazing. The book contains so much more than we've only touched on tonight. And as you said, it's a available at theingoswan.com or Amazon. I also encourage the listeners to go to the ingoswan.com website to learn more about the amazing Mr. Swan. Tonight we have talked almost exclusively about Ingo Swan, the psychic and the writer, but he was so much more. Many people know him best for his visionary artwork. To see some of his artwork, go to that ingoswan.com website but to see some of his best works in person, go to the amazing American Visionary Art Museum in Baltimore, Maryland. Dr. Bob, I know you're very familiar with that. And while there, they should check out the rest of that surprising museum. They'll be glad that they did. They sure will. But boy, hang out at that at the stairway. Um, <laughs> because that's Aren't where... Aren't they amazing? The, 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 the paintings there... Uh, just elevate your consciousness. That's how I look at his work and what he has done. And what he has done for our planet is he has succeeded in getting this information out. And, you know, it's especially when you have the three guests that we've had here tonight that know him and work with him in different ways that prove to me that he indeed has succeeded uh, we do a show on 21st Century Radio and have done over 33 years. We pay for this show. We do not, we are no way in the world going to ever make any money off of these kind of things. And because of that, um, we I understand that that at least we can lay things out there and other people can listen to them and make up their own minds. I think that you can't go wrong in thinking that this great soul, Ingo Swan, who is, in my opinion, was with us tonight, uh, uh, he's not gone forever. He'll be around again. I want to thank you for joining us on 21st Century Radio, Tom. Don't forget, friends, now plan a visit to the American Visionary Art Museum in Baltimore. And that's the end of the hour. 21st Century Radio is produced by Hieronymus and Company, and our executive producer and research assistant is Laura Courtner. I'm Dr. Bob Hieronymus, and remember to get a haircut.